right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I will monitor the um, waiting room to see if anyone else pops in. Um, so for those of you who do not know, my name is Rashida Randall. I am the, um, the festival director for the Circle City Film Festival. I got this vision probably about four or five years ago, but I didn't execute it until three years ago. Where, um, so we're in our third year. And unfortunately, due to COVID, um, we were kind of forced to be virtual this year. Thank goodness for adaptability, because I was really, really worried about not being able to have the festival this year. It's something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I'm just very grateful to be able to um, be able to move it into a new format and it's executed as well that it has been. I am so thankful for all of you, all of our panelists, all of our filmmakers, directors who have been um, made themselves available for this particular panel. Um, I am forever indebted to you for that. So thank you so, so much to those of you who have taken the time out to attend the panel. Thank you for making the time as well. Um, I hope that you all, you know, can walk away from this with new nuggets to add to your careers. And I, the most importantly, I really hope that you walk away from it inspired. So without further ado, I am not going to do much talking on this panel. Thank you to Nikki, who has really kind of taken the reins on it for me. Um, I've had to deal with a whole lot with putting this festival together. So I'm like, Nikki, can you please just kind of help me out here and she did just that. And so I'm super appreciative to you, Nikki. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, Nikki is serving as our moderator for uh, the director's panel this year. After a long international career as a critically acclaimed dancer and choreographer in Canada, London and New York, Nikki Cole made her first career transition. After attending the New York School of Ed film program as a new mom, she picked up a camera and started making her own films, documentaries about her life in dance and theater. One of them, Intimacies, about Hollywood's first openly gay and HIV positive actor, Michael Kearns, won the audience vote at the Palm Springs International Film Festival. After many award-winning indie films gained her entrance into the docuseries TV World, where she made her living doing shows like Take This House and Sell It, Storage Wars, and Ice Road Truckers for many years while she raised her daughter as a mostly single mom. All the while, she never let go of her dream of making narrative films and TV. She kept directing her own shorts and writing longer projects, and finally, after many years, she landed a directing job on a BBC kids series called The Next Step. Her screenplays began winning awards and she is now developing two series, two features, and a documentary. Sound like a smooth ride? It wasn't. So I'm gonna let her tell you all about it. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Miss Nikki Cole. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. Thank you Rashida and Rashida. No slouch there. She's an actress, she's a filmmaker, and she's a festival organizer. And I know what it, I worked in event organization, festival organizations for a long time as well. It's a hell of a lot of work. So, and she's doing it mostly by herself, based in Atlanta, although the film festival's in Indianapolis, and now we're virtual and we're all over the world. But it, it's kind of remarkable to be able to come together from all these places. And, and I, I'm, I'm just really want to thank you, Rashida, for, for doing this. And I'm going to do my land acknowledgement, which is important. And I'm about to mangle some words, so please forgive me in advance. I acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, Toronto means where there are trees standing in the water. I stand on the shoulders of these people, as well as the millions of peaceful and not so peaceful immigrants who arrived on these lands from every place on the planet. Um, I want to welcome all of you as I've done as you've come in. I think we're going to have an interesting and enlightening conversation about what's been called the most difficult transition in mm -hmm. our industry. I actually didn't know that <laughs> when I just kept, when I picked up that camera and I started shooting, I was just all excited. I didn't excited. even know we ate quinoa last night. Oh. Oh, goodness. Yeah, Penny, you're- What is quinoa? I don't even know what it is. It's a grain. And, and I did a 
What is quinoa? Your line. I got it. Can you mute her? <laughs> All right, go for it. I'm curious about the quinoa. A voice, a voice in the haze. <laughs> Penny, we love you, and we're glad that we, we're muting whatever's going on there for now. So anyway, um, I had no idea when I picked up a camera and started shooting that this, I knew nothing about anything, so I just wanted to shoot anything, and I did. And I just shot everything I could with the resources I had, which was pretty much nothing but a camera. So um, along with us today, we've got some other remarkable filmmakers who have gone through their own process and we're going to hear about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of them first, like all like one at a time, and then we will talk after that. So sorry for the long intros, but here we go. Uh, Namisha Mukherjee, Merker, I you already corrected me, but I think I got it right this time. An award-winning filmmaker, Namisha's work has premiered in competition at Tribeca and the Toronto International Film Festival. And her debut feature, 65 Red Roses, was selected by Oprah Winfrey for her documentary club on OWN. The film went on to be acquired by Netflix and Hulu. Subsequent features include Jacinta, produced with Impact Partners, Tempest Storm, released theatrically by Mongo Media, and Blood Relative, which earned her a second Canadian Screen Award nomination for directing. She's won four Leo Awards, most recently for her work as an episodic director on the teen sci-fi series Mech X4. Mech X4, am I saying that? Mech, Mech. For Disney XD, additional directorial credits include season one, seasons one and two of Disney's teen action comedy series, Gabby Duran and the Unsittables, Christmas Unleashed for Lifetime, and both Chronicle Mysteries, The Deep End, and Fashionably Yours for Hallmark. Welcome, Namisha. Next, we have uh, Ashley Maria. Where did you go? Ashley is a director and writer located in Los Angeles in, this, in the smoke and haze at the moment. She's received her MFA from the USC School of Cinematic Arts, is the recipient of the prestigious Directors Guild of America Award for her narrative film, Friday Night Fright. And most recently, she was recognized as the best new director at the Downtown LA Film Festival for her feature documentary, Pioneers in Skirts. I love that title. Ashley is, an, is also an advocate for advancing women's opportunities. She is a North American delegate to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, the principal global policymaking body dedicated exclusively to gender equality and the advancement of women. Welcome, Ashley Maria. And if you don't know her name, you do now. <laughs> Which is great. Faith. Faith Pennick is joining us from Chicago. Her filmography includes the documentaries Silent Choices and Weightless, and the narrative short films Running on Eggshells and Haunt. She is currently in development of her narrative feature film directorial debut, Double Effect. Pennick is also a freelance writer and a book author. She wrote Voodoo, a book about D'Angelo's Voodoo album for Bloomsbury's 33 and a Third music series. Pennick earned her earned her BA at the University of Michigan and an MA at New York University's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. Welcome, Faith. Hi, thanks for having me. Carl, Carl Jason, my hometown boy from Toronto. Carl is a critically acclaimed director and showrunner who brings the wealth of global diaspora to impactful storytelling. His directing and acting experience in both theater and film has not only made him an actor's director, it has also driven him to create strong, visually arresting narratives. Carl has directed projects filmed in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. His experience in storytelling is varied, encompassing dramatic television, cutting edge do documentary series, high octane docudramas, I love how that's written, high octane docudramas and nail-biting stories from the wild. His directing acumen is augmented by his experience producing and first assistant directing. Carl's unscripted credits include Worst Thing I Ever Did and Science of Sin. His scripted credits are The Gift and Spawn and Geezer. Welcome, Carl. Happy Hi, night. guys. Good to be here. Well, you should put your Canadian flag background up now for us so that we know where you're from. No, I'm not going to do that. He was teasing us with it before. Tomei. Tomei. 
Tomei. I knew I'd get nervous and say it wrong. Tomei. Tomei Hatsios directing credits include the scripted portion of two crime series, Murderous Affairs and Motive to Murder. Her documentary lifestyle credits include Gnawa, Trance and Dance, Three Months in Morocco, GFI OG Punks, I'm sure I said that wrong, and Million Dollar Home Hacks, for Bravo, which was a Bravo pilot. Her producing credits include four feature length films, supervising producer on six two crime series, a successful web series and many commercials and music videos, including Drake's Tuesday, which has over 165 million views and not all of them in Canada where he's from. Sorry, I had to dig that in, sorry. Tomei's, Tomei's commitment to inclusivity manifests in over 15 years of creating content with her production company, Medahara Productions. Welcome, Tomei. So, as you can see, we have an illustrious group ahead of us, and uh, I'm just really excited to jump in here finally. Um, I'd like to start with each of you. If you can tell us in a few words about the aha moment you had when you decided you had to be a filmmaker and what you did about it at the time. Anybody can just put up their hand here who wants to, who wants to go that. Tomai, do you want to unmute yourself? Tomei. Tomei. <laughs> That's okay. You usually get it right. I do. Um, um, I was, uh, I had toured the United States, Canada, and Europe, um, and part of Africa, as a performance artist um, with a um, multimedia installation of performance art ensemble. And, and uh, what I realized with my most, uh, my last vision as a live theater world person was that I was trying to get live performances to work like com composited film images. And over and again, <laughs> my vision was filmic. I just hadn't worked in film yet, so I didn't realize it. And then um, I serendipitously met some Canadians who are, were absolutely lovely in the Yucatan. And they helped me realize that what I was seeing and visioning was, uh, was filmic. And that they gave me my first job. Uh, it's a very long story about ser how serendipitous that was. But they gave me my first job on video postcards for the BBC. And then to support um, my talent by developing skills, I moved to Los Angeles. So I moved from New Orleans to Los Angeles in 1996, specifically to get on the job training experience. Awesome, awesome. So it seems like it was that moment when they said to you, it's film, what you're seeing is film. Yeah, you yeah, they were like, you're torturing people. Like I was putting people through the air, literally building these, you know, these huge infrastructures that people could float through the air. And really I just wanted composited images. And they said, well, you can do that in Final Cut. <laughs> like, what Final Cut? So it was a definite aha, yes. Who's next? Who else wants to talk about their aha moment? Nimisha, unmute yourself, please. Um, yeah, I, my aha moment was uh, I, I went to university um, as an English lit major. I didn't, I worked at Rogers Video. I loved movies, but I didn't know anybody in the industry. I'd, I'd never met someone who actually had a job. I knew that there were directors and screenwriters, but beyond that, I didn't really understand how the system worked at all. And so I applied, uh, I took a film production class just as an elective because I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed like, you know, shooting things in high school, but I didn't, again, didn't know how to, what, it just went, was a hobby. So I didn't really understand how do you go from a hobby to a career. And, um, and then while I was at uh, UBC, I took that film class and at the end of the year, you could apply to the film production program. They were accepting 15 students a year. And I didn't, I hadn't really been aware that the program there created some very major talent within the Canadian landscape had actually come out of that program. It was highly competitive and I ended up shortlisted. And I think when I was shortlisted was the moment I went, oh no, 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 no. I 100% want to be a director. This is not, I am going to reapply and kind of that 
I think it was great that it started with a rejection because that's so much of what this industry really is about, persevering in the face of um, the no. Uh, and so I think that that, I really took that to heart. That was like my very first real experience was getting a no and saying, oh no, I'm not accepting that. I am going to find a way. And then reapplying and getting in and that kind of changed the trajectory of, um, of my life, so. Awesome, awesome. Who else? Faith, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, before I get into my aha moment, I would like, as a former New Yorker, I would like to acknowledge today and the more than 3,000 souls who passed away 19 years ago on September 11th, 2001. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, my aha moment was, I mean, the short answer was the documentary Who Dreams, uh, which for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a beautiful film. It came out in, I believe, late 1994. I saw it in 1995. And it's actually set in my hometown of Chicago uh, about two young men who are playing. They start out playing in the same, um, for the same high school in, in, uh, bas in, on the basketball team. And then they end up, one ends up transferring to another high school. And basically you see their trajectories through the four years of high school. And I actually expected to hate it. And I saw it actually at uh, the, actually what a theater, I saw it in Brooklyn, New York, a theater, unfortunately it's now on American Apparel, it's on Flatbush Avenue. And just fell in love with the film. I walked out and it was literally like, I looked, it sounds corny, but I literally looked up to the heavens and was like, if I can, create anything as even a fraction as poignant as brilliant and as brilliant as this film is. That's what I want to do. Um, so after that, I applied to NYU and went there, got my master's. I actually, I wasn't in Tisch, I was in Gallatin. Uh, Tisch is where the film school is. I, I was in Gallatin where you could basically create your own master's program. And so I did what I call my half MBA, half MFA. Uh, which I loved, but I hate the student loan debt, but that's another conversation. And really, after I got out of NYU, originally I wanted to produce. That was my uh, original trajectory, was just to be to produce other directors and help them make their films. And the more I thought about it, I had all these ideas for films, and I thought, well, well if I don't make these films, these films may never get made. And I think that's what led me to make solid choices and then running on eggshells. And um, yeah, and that's basically what got me, that, that put, that's what put me on this path is who drinks. And if you haven't seen it, I think it's in the Criterion co Collection, I believe. So that's one way to access it. I don't know if it's on any of the streamers, but definitely check it out if you haven't already. I'm sure one can find it. I love that film. It, it wasn't my aha moment for becoming a filmmaker, but I absolutely fell in love with that film. I loved it. And Faith, thank you so much for the September 11th tribute. I, it was something I thought about at 4 a.m. that, I, <laughs> and then I forgot to write it down and it went out of my head. So thank you, thank you, thank you, much appreciated. And it's a very important day. Who's Hi. next? Carl. I'll, I'll go next. Um, Hoop Dreams, great film. And I think, uh, not, not my aha moment, um, I have a kind of a strange entry into film because I was really going to be a marine biologist before I got hooked by storytelling. And I think I got hooked in storytelling by theater and kind of going out for a play, getting the part and just loving it, loving telling stories and realized a lot of what I wanted to do in other fields really came down to telling stories and, and sort of learning and, and regurgitating what, you know, I'd learned in story form. Um, so many steps to me are my aha moments. I remember um, I went through kind of a traditional um, path in a sense, going to university, studying film and theater. Um, and there realizing that I loved working with actors, having acted myself. Um, and it's, it, it, I think it's one of those funny moments. We talk about aha. When I first went to um, university for film and at the end they had a questionnaire and they said, what did you want to do in film? And I was like, well, you know, the only two things I really wanted to do were editing and directing. And then I thought, if I want to 
direct, then I would like to understand acting more. So went the acting route. I, I studied theater in, in university and film and almost killed myself. But it was a great, it was a great cauldron to learn. And so I think that um, when it boils down, the aha moments is when those, those times, like hoop dreams, like other things, when stories grip you and you think, I've got to tell it, you know, that's, that's what excites me. So um, I think you can get into film in many different ways and you can have many different moments of a, aha, this is what I need. And sometimes you can get really um, depressed and down and think, what am I doing? And then something else picks you up with another aha. And that's it. Thank you, Carl. I, I'm always, because I came from the dance world where everybody really had a sort of a dance background. You know, they studied dance for 10 years and then they became dancers. And it, when I came into film, it was like, oh my goodness, people from every different possible background. And I just, I have my own aha moments, which we don't go into, and I have them all the time too, Carl. But it, it, I'm just always amazed at how, how many people come from different backgrounds. Ashley Maria. Hey. Okay, so uh, I think the best way to put it is I was like fighting and kicking to pick anything else and like uh, went into, I was ready to pull the trigger and go into aerospace engineering. Like that was where I was headed. And then I um, went to the Wrights Museum, like the, the Wright Brothers in North Carolina and uh, and I, my mom was like, you care more about who's filming over there than how they built these planes. And I'm like, shut up, mom, you know? But it just kind of made me go, all right, let, let me figure out what I, what I want. And then Ashley, Maria, we've lost you, you've frozen. Aw. So, oh, so, so it was, we left you after your mom said, you're over there filming. More interested in filming over there. Okay, good. I'll be quick then because um, LA internet isn't great. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I, I tried to do anything else and it just kept drawing me back in and I decided to go to film school at USC. And I think it was there where I discovered I could be a director. Like I didn't really know what my role would be, but I had a professor there who saw uh, a script I wrote, understood my sense of humor and said, actually, it's pretty good. You're not weird. And, uh, and then I continued on. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, you know, they always say, if you can think of anything else, try that because filmmaking is so tough. And I tried, I tried, but I did not succeed. Yeah, and it also saves you from feeling that you're weird in the world because <laughs> it's like, there are other weird people out here too, actually doing it in, against all odds, so. All the weirdos. Okay, so I'd like now to just move on to the, to the conversation about how you made your transition, what was, what are you up against? And I know most of you went from docs into, oh, I also, sorry, I want to just define everything here because there's so many different words. I think we all understand, but just in case we don't, unscripted is called so many things and I'm calling it everything that's a documentary, a lifestyle, a reality, a music, well, music video, not so much because that's more narrative to me but anything where we're dealing with real people and scripted anything of any genre that we're dealing with actors and, and creating story that way it's all storytelling to me but uh which we'll get into in a minute but i'd like to hear and i know each of you has a different transition i'd love you to chat a little bit each one at a time about your transition and how it was and what were the challenges or was it easy peasy I'll go first. <laughs> um, well, I came out to LA with my son as a single mom and no connections, no family, no friends. Uh, my rent increased 10 times uh, overnight just by moving to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I, I had the dance background. I started just doing, you know, many odd jobs as a single mom to, to afford being here. And everyone that I met, I told that I wanted to be a, that I wanted to work in film. I was working my way into being a director and a writer as I had been in theater. I got um, literally physically pat on my head. I got laughed at. 
Um, uh, there were a few attempted assaults. Um, I was told that I should be an actor because of the way I looked. Um, and then finally, I had the opportunity to work for free as a production assistant on a project. And that led to um, working on NBC promos, where I was working with union, uh, union craftspeople and at the highest level, um, learning from them. And then the same production manager that took a chance on me on those um, promos also did independent films. So I was learning like indie, indie film and you know this high level commercial world at the same time. And I worked my way up from PA to AD, uh, PM, producer and then I got to direct a commercial and um, and it, it went from there. It was very, uh, there was a lot of, at that time, a lot of misogyny, um, you know, and a lot of uh, what are you? A lot of people tried to figure out what my ethnic background was before they knew my name. Um, but I, that didn't, I just, I disregarded that and just kept my eye on the prize. Like I need to get experience. I couldn't afford to go back to school. I was already a single mom. I needed to learn while I was working. And I was an excellent PA. I worked, I, I showed up and gave 100% and that led to moving up very quickly. So most, of, most of that was in scripted, that you're working your way up in scripted. Yes. And then- I worked in scripted until 2011. So then how did Doc and Unscripted come into this? Uh, I had been doing a lot of Korean commercials where I was either an AD or a producer on Korean commercials. Korean commercials, um, the, the culture feels a lot like um, Greek and Italian. So I, I felt very at home and they loved me and just kept hiring me over and over again whenever they would come in from Korea. And uh, a PM, who had worked on those commercials called me in desperation one night and said, Hey, I'm working on a true crime show. I need someone to break down the schedule. And um, I wonder if you would do it. And he told me the rate and I couldn't say no. <laughs> so I did it. And then the showrunner, Tammy Wood, also known as the queen of crime, Discovery ID loves her. She's an excellent uh, showrunner in true crime. And um, she said she wanted to meet me. And uh, that led to me ADing, then PMing, and then being a supervising producer and a director. And in true crime, a supervising producer does a lot of what a, a film director would do. So as a supervising producer on Tammy's shows, I create a mood board or a, a, a mood book, uh, a glam book for, uh, you know, I put together a mood board for... I'm just going to interrupt you a second because I just want to hear about the transition into scripted okay. from there. Yeah. So the transition was just um, the person who, uh, who introduced me to Korean commercials was also doing to crime and he just said, hey, we need help. And, you know, it, as in any uh, aspect of the film industry, when you do well, People want to keep working with you no matter what they're working on. And so I just kept getting work in that realm. It just, it took over. So it, even though it took a long time, it was a fairly easy transition to go into scripted then from through your work in true crime and part of true crime is doc and drama. And so you kind of segued through the doc drama part into scripted. Is that, is that what you would say? Yeah, I think the, I think the big, um, I think what made it easy for me to transition from feature length films and commercials and music videos into true crime is that I've only worked on the scripted aspect of true crime, the reenactments. I have a script and I work with actors and I work with a casting director. So the only thing that makes it more reality TV like is that we choose actors who look like the real people. <laughs> That's a big part of it. Okay. So it sounds like it's a it's a pretty valid way to make a transition into drama is through docudrama, which is great. I think so. Yeah. I think awesome. So. Thank you.
Carl. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to jump in here because I, I've done the same thing. I think Tomai has done in the sense that, you know, you start at the bottom is one of the best ways to get in and you work your way up and never underestimate that cry of desperation. Um, because the same thing, I worked in scripted um, coming out of uh, university and um, a producer that I worked with was in docudramas and said, three, I got three days, I've got to go to, you know, uh, camera in three days, I need help, can you come? And the same thing, I was a supervising producer on a film, an, an awful thing on the Iraq war, um, mainly because of the writing was very slanted, I wanted to get out and I said, I'm there. Um, don't underestimate mentors. I think in making that transition, the cry of desperation is sort of like having a mentor. Um, mentors can sometimes lead the way and break down your way into your next project, be it scripted or unscripted. They can help you make that transition. Um, you know, they can say, I know that person and I know that they can do this because inevitably in this business, you get pigeonholed, whatever you're doing. And they say, well, you can only do this. You can only do comedy if you're inscripted and you can't do drama. You, you can only do fiction and you can't do this. So mentors can ease that way. So there's two ways that I was, I made the bridge. One, mentors to that cry of desperation. You just hope that somebody's going to put their hand up and say, help, you know, and then you can make that jump. So, so for both Carl and Tommy, this Tommy, this, it was, it seems kind of natural and organic. And I'm curious to hear from anybody else who had other similar or dissimilar or let's go to faith now. Hi. Um, I, yeah, I definitely wanted to follow up on what, uh, particularly what Tomei said. I think if particular, if there's any, um, up and coming filmmakers, I don't, I almost said young, but I want to say that because some up and coming filmmakers are not young necessarily, but up and coming filmmakers, Tomei's story, I think it's important in that two things. One, you don't have to go to film school to be a filmmaker. I mean, I think what she did, and I think Carl touched on that as well, is working your way up, get in on the bottom, you know, PA, uh, if, you know, internship. And if you make relationships with the right people, you can, you know, you can glean knowledge, experience, and work your way up. Now, that comes with a certain level of privilege in the sense that not, you know, PA, PA doesn't pay very well. So not everybody has the, the ability to be able to do that. So I just wanna throw that out there as well. So, but it, I, I think that's important to, you know, it's a relationship industry and it's as much about who knows you and who likes you as it is the work that you do. The work you do is important, but um, you know, I can speak to, and I know people who can also speak to work their butts off, but somebody didn't like them or someone liked someone else more. And it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing, but I think, it, you know, you don't have to go to a fancy expensive film school to be a filmmaker. Um, I, what I will say for me is that what I did is I just made films. I didn't, you know, I just said, you know, I'm just going to find the money and apply it, particularly for my first documentary, Silent Choices, my first feature documentary, I should say. Um, you know, I applied. It, it took me six years to make that film. Uh, but I was just, I worked a full-time job while I was doing it. And, and I made my first narrative short, Running on Eggshells, in 2000. That came out in 2003, while I was still working on Silent Choices, while I was working on a full-time full job. I look back on that, I don't know how my brain just didn't completely explode, but I wanted to, I didn't want to, what Carl was talking about, I didn't want to get pigeonholed because if you, I particularly, I don't I can't speak to Canada and the UK because it seems like they're more open to doc filmmakers doing narrative. In the United States and particularly in Hollywood, there's very much like you're either in the documentary lane or the reality lane or you're in the scripted narrative lane. And I, I don't, it, it drives me nuts that that's a thing. And I think if I could do it over, the one thing I would suggest, if I could do it over, I would have started out in narrative. I would have started out in fiction and then transitioned to, to nonfiction. I think it's a lot harder. And I've had this conversation with other docs, so I know it's not just me. 
uh, it's, I think it's, at least in the United States, I think it's harder to transition from being a documentary filmmaker into going into narrative. Uh, I would have done it the other way around. Um, but I say, you know, getting that on, on the ground experience and frankly, just making films. And that means, you know, I mean, now again, you know, when I started doing this, we didn't have Kickstarter, we didn't have Indiegogo, you know, it was basically credit cards and friends and family. So now you have those, you know, you have Patreon, you have all these things where you, you know, you can sort of, you know, and social media helps with that. So definitely, you know, if you have a strong social media presence, uh, that will help you as far as raising money for your films. Obviously with documentaries, you, you can access more like fun, you know, grant funding with narratives. It's pretty much, you got to find investors. You got to find. Yeah, I just want, we're going to come, oh, we're going to come back to okay, that sorry. about, yes. about how to go forward, but I just no want to concentrate right now on this transition okay. and the pigeonholing, which is you, you've touched on it, Faith. And, and um, I'm going to, Namisha, I'm, I know you, We've got to lose you soon, but because of what Ashley's going to say, I want to just go to her because she's she's actually come from this a different route. Is that right, Ashley? Yeah. I love that intro. All right, let's cross fingers. Internet works. Um, so if you've seen my documentary film, look it up. It's Pioneers in Skirts. It is my experience um, coming from the scripted space, you know, specifically in horror in. Um, comedy in action and of course being told oh you're a woman that's so cute that's really sweet and i'm like um what and so kind of realizing that that's how this industry was perceiving me especially in the genre in the genre world which um i'm sure faith can also talk about how you get pigeonholed into one genre especially if you're a woman they expect you to be able to only do like romantic or drama and that is absolutely not me but um so what i did was out of necessity i picked up a camera and started making pioneers and skirts but i didn't understand what i was making at the time yet i just knew i need to figure out really is there a light at the end of the tunnel for me so like what is going on in our industry why is this still happening and what do we actually do about it and so i went outside of the film industry to kind of understand solutions in that sense and i will say going from scripted to documentary was challenging in that you obviously don't have like a, a, a line item, like, I know I have to check this off and get this stuff. I have to kind of see what I get, prepare for these interviews, but be incredibly flexible. Um, but then as time goes on, you realize, okay, I totally know how to run this set. I know how to, you know, get this shoot going. I'm totally fine with running production. Then it comes to editing. And then that's where you go, oh no, I need somebody who's way smarter than me. And so it's just kind of like, you figure out the kind of team you need from scripted into documentary and it, they look a little different. Um, and it's obviously a much longer haul. And so personally, I'm in that space now, like what Faith was saying is I'm going from documentary back into horror. And I will say that I am more confident in transitioning over because I've spent the last five years demanding for what I want. And so if anything, I am ready for this, for this transition, because I already know there's going to be a lot of opposition and I don't care. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful, it's true, because when you're doing a doc, especially your own doc, you're just flying by the seat of your pants and you're, you're, <laughs> you're basically marshalling all of your resources. And that's really interesting. That's just, so, so, so she's gone, now she's gone scripted, unscripted and now is going back and feeling stronger from having done documentaries, which I think is really interesting. Thank you. Namisha. Yeah, it's really interesting just to hear everybody's, um, like how they actually got into it. I mean, for me, I, I have a bit of a, a reverse story in terms of like, I actually really did start in documentary. Like I did a student short, I did a narrative, but I got, you know, I worked as a PA and I was really good at it, but I also was like concerned that I would forget why I was actually there in the first place because I'd been told it's about a 10 year journey from, you know, PAing into the director's chair. And not that it was a shorter journey for me, but I didn't, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So I said, okay, I have to just go and put all this time and energy into making my own films. And so that's what I did. My first film 
you know, and then that was my first film at, you know, 25, you know, got the attention of OWN. It was like a huge success. And that just meant that I could now go do another film because also you're at the mercy of whatever's going on in the world. And there was a recession that hit in 2009 and there were no jobs in Vancouver. And so I said, okay, what I can do is I can make another film. And so I went and I made three more documentaries as I was making shorts. But the problem of course is, you're, as, as someone mentioned, you're now put into this box of you, you do docs, that's what you do. You can't do anything else. So that means you probably can't work with actors, you can't work with the effects, you don't know how to run a big major team. So I, I understood that. So my kind of stepping stone from the documentary experience was to start working in Factual. So I got hired by Nat Geo, by Vice, and I became an episodic director in Factual. And what was great about that was I could actually survive it was more sustainable than directing and directing and producing my own work because of course you know you're the last person to get paid when you're doing that work so it was a way to now okay i can work on these factual shows and keep doing my docs and then at that point it became like watching people who had made one short film often men uh often white men get an opportunity to start directing an episodic and what really started to piss me off about that was i was like all the work i'm doing and i'm getting paid on non-union and they're doing less work to some degree and they're getting paid so much more. And so it really became about, I took it kind of as a personal thing that, you know, it's not fair that I'm doing all this work. I'm still doing broadcast work. It's the same time and I'm getting paid a fraction of the amount. So I basically started doing these programs. Um, there were very few programs, but I started doing them and they were like almost like survivor for women. They would like, like Disney would pick, five women would interview and you would get the chance to shadow which means you don't usually get paid if you're watching some other director work but they said hey we'll pick five out of the five one we'll come back shadow again and then maybe get an episode so i was that person so i went through that disney chain but then it was like crickets there were no there was no second season yet so i was like i'm gonna go back into factual this is crazy like i'm gonna keep working on my docs but then I had someone, uh, Carl mentioned mentorship, I had someone really say, w stop, wait, like there's another program, it's called the two times more program, you will, you would shadow, but then if you get selected, you get your own episode. And there were three women from across Canada selected for that. I did that. And because I got an episode of Dino Dana and I had, I could show that I had some VFX experience, they basically, Disney hired me then for my first half hour on Mega X4. And then I didn't work for a year. It literally took a whole nother year of going to LA, Toronto, back and forth, getting an agent, getting an LA agent, having my Canadian representation, and then literally fighting for a chance to get on that first season of Gabby Duran, which was a Disney show. And I'd already worked with Disney and it still took a year of really hardcore hustling. And then I made uh, as I was producing a film, a documentary film, because I kind of was like, I still love doc, but it's just not sustainable. Um, and then from that, I basically, so now you're like, everyone was like, great, now you can work with kids. That doesn't mean you can work with adults. So now I had to show them, hey, I can do, I can work with adults. So then I had to hustle to get on an MOW for Hallmark. Nobody dreams of directing for Hallmark, but I really needed to show that I could you know, work with grownups. And so I like made, you know, Alison Sweeney was the producer and the lead actor on Chronicle Mysteries. I met with her. We love, both love true crime. I've watched all these documentaries. I've been working in documentary space. And she basically said, I'm going to give you a shot. So I was the first female director on that series. And she literally gave me that chance. And because of that, I started working with Hallmark. And because of the Disney work, the Hallmark work, I finally just booked my first one hour of prime time in the fall, which has been a five year, you know, hus hardcore hustle to get it. Um, and then of course my whole career started, you know, in 2007 with my first documentary feature. So that is sort of the journey really fast, sorry, because I'm gonna have to go in like 10 minutes. But it was like, now prime time to me was like, okay, great, now I'm doing prime time, now I can, live i can hopefully continue living and afford my afford a lifestyle where i can start now developing my own projects so now i'm developing my own series so the whole goal is always how do i get the freedom uh to be able to actually produce the work i want to produce 
And I, thank you so much, Namisha. It's an incredible, great story. And the themes that I keep hearing over and over again from everybody is defy the pigeonholing, which is really what we're talking about today, and persist and be determined. That same thing that was that caused you to want to become a filmmaker, when Namisha, when you were told no, as you said, it got you primed and ready to go and not take no for an answer, faith. No, I just want to, because I know Namisha has to go soon. I wanted to ask her a quick question. Um, do you think everything you just did, do you think that it would have taken less time for you to get that? It was, you say you just booked a one hour directing, television directing gig, right? Yeah. Would, would it take, do you think it would have taken less time if you had been white and male? Of course. And, and if so, by how much? I added three years to my, of three years of really hard, because every, and especially in the Canadian system, this is what's so funny, I ended up hire, I'm getting hired on the American shows, but in the Canadian system, everyone kept saying, we're not going to give you a chance if you can't prove that you have the experience. Well, experience is just bullshit for, you just want to hire the same people that you keep hiring. Right. We're all the same people who know you, who are mostly a certain ethnicity, but are mostly privileged and mostly have been, you know, it's like the same. So it was really about not getting angry about that, but going, accepting it, and then yeah. really learning how to pitch myself because immediately the moment I would show up to the, you know, the interview, it, everything's working against me, right? And all the work they would use against me. They would say, oh, you've only done kids. You've only done VFX, but only with kids. You've only done stunts, but only on MOWs. So everything, I had to figure out a way to constantly take how they throw my work at me as a negative and start using it as a positive. And really, ultimately, why I booked this one hour is I just went in guns blazing, being so passionate, because I knew the series inside out that I really connected with the showrunner and I got that meeting myself because I went after the producing director. So again, it's just like showing how much is involved in getting a job. It's not, I didn't just do an interview as free form set up by my agent and get the job. I had to go do set up all those other meetings, make everyone like me so that by the time they were all in the same room, it was really hard for them to say no. Right. No, I think everything you said is pretty much what you have to do, particularly to get episodic TV. Work. Well, in, so congratulations every, yeah absolutely and in every industry women have always we've always had to prove uh, women of color women of women of all of us we've always had to prove and be better than the guys so i'm going to just we got one guy with us one white guy and i carl we are not holding you responsible for yeah. every micro every transgression and officially I'm, I'm mixed race but um i'll stand in for the white guy if you want um, Please give us your thoughts on this. I'm curious. My, my thoughts are, hey, um, everything that everybody else has said on the panel, female and whatever, um, I've had to face as well. And I can't tell you the times and not. And I do, I do think it's it's harder, of course, for um, anybody who people don't see as people that they know and feel comfortable with, and a whole lot, lot of stuff. But I think what what Namisha said is that you need to make somehow, and I've had this problem, and I had it last week, where people say, oh, you've done this, but uh, I don't know if you can do this. Let's see, I'll look at your reel, and maybe, and you get that all the time. I don't, and I, I know that, I, actually, so there's white males that I know that have faced that all the time, and they're washed by the side, and they'll never see the light of day, um, and it's, it's a hard business, and, for people to put money out there, like I've never been, I keep telling people, I've never been hired by people I don't know in some way or the other, or being, be referred to by people I don't know. Nobody does that. I just got a job yesterday from somebody I just actually just texted and said, hey, you know, I was just out of the blue, you know, I'd never even thought. And they went, oh yeah, I know you. What about doing this? And I wouldn't have even got called if I had made the effort. Like Namisha says, you got to hammer on those doors to get through. Um, I think but, uh, I I hear you, Carl, and I don't want this to become a no, my no, no. pain is worse than your pain. But no, no, I do no, want to say, I, 
I and just want to say that what you said is absolutely correct. People yeah. don't hire people they don't know. And yeah, when you exactly. when you come up to the system and you've been hired over and over again by people who know you and you look like them, I'm not saying it's not I'm not saying it's been easy. It is just harder. It is an extra three years. And it's a comfort level. I think you should should know that people like to hire. I mean, it's it's terrible, right? They hire the same people over and over again because they worked with them and they, they know them. They just say, I, I know Joe or whoever. Exactly. That's also one hire. of the, you know, one of the benefits of education. I, I couldn't afford school. I, I lived in abject poverty and homelessness on and off throughout a lot of my uh, teenhood and adult, young adulthood. So for me, working my way up, being able to be paid while I was learning, I wasn't just um, surviving as a PA. I also catered with the temp catering staff. I bartended with the temp bartending staff. I taught classes in yoga. I had so many jobs that people joke about it. Um, I had a lot of jobs. What I saw about people who, who um, can go to school is, it, is the access. That's, it affords you access if you are in school fight for the best internship you can possibly get. If you have to sleep on couches, if you get that internship at, at Sony or you know a big studio, that's gonna open much bigger doors. And um, cause it is who you know, it does, you wanna hire the same people over and over again. You learn to trust them, they become like family. My crew is like my family. I've had the same woman gaffer since 1998. She's my first call. So I, I, think that, I think that a lot of sacrifice goes into anyone's career. Um, certainly the less privilege you have, the higher the mountain is to climb. And, and, I, and I, I, I do want to move on, but I also do want to recognize that there are finally now programs for BIPOC people, which you know, wasn't in existence, Faith, when you were starting out. And now there's finally an acknowledgement that in order to- They absolutely pay, were not. <laughs> I know. And, and, and now that, well, because in order to get that experience, in order to be familiar with those people, and those doors were closed for so long, just because people didn't know them and there was no trust and there was no foot up and there was no, I'm desperate, can you help me? Because that person couldn't help them because they weren't experienced enough. So finally we are moving into a new phase where it's mandated for in canada anyway and all the american studios are doing it too that they, they now have to bring in and lift up people of color indigenous people women lgbt disabled like we're now finally on the verge of opening things up so that there there is change but it is slow and I just want to acknowledge that because I think it's it's hard to see it when you're not in those shoes, Carl. It just is. And and I hear Namisha when she says it took an extra three years for her. And it it I have the same thing. So having said that and acknowledged that, I would like to move on to the nuts and bolts of, of the of the similarities and the differences between unscripted and scripted, because I find them very interesting. I wrote this article, which is why this all happened, that we we the, the actual process, the nuts and bolts process is different and similar. And I would love to hear from everybody. And we'll just start from the research phase because I find research, I want to just go through the whole process, through research, uh, writing, casting, pre-production, production, and post. Because I think there's, there's just to educate people as to what, what happens in each phase and why they're different. So, um, and I know we all have stories. And who would like to talk about research in both fields and how they're the same and how they differ? Tommy. Uh, there's so many similarities between true crime reenactment and uh, feature length film research uh, and development, um, except that true crime uh, goes further. Before I get involved as the director or producer, supervising producer of uh, the reenactments, there has already been a team that's been working for at least six months, gathering information on the story, gathering archival footage, interviews with uh, all the key players that are alive, um, 
witnesses, sheriffs, prisoners, um, families of the victims. So they gather all of that. And then when I come into the show, I'm given all of that information. And it's like, here's, <laughs> here's like, you know, six months worth of, of uh, research, boom, in my lap. And then I have to start um, doing the research on, you know, well, what did, what did that person, what would that person have worn? So I can put together the glam book for each character for the wardrobe person and same with the makeup and production design and location and et cetera. Um, it's a little bit different in, you know, in commercials, your prep is a couple days maybe. Uh, in music videos, if you wrote the treatment for a music video, you know, there's the research you do is before you write the treatment on the song and the band and get a feel for them. But in features and, and true crime, it's very similar, I think. Um, Anybody want to talk about research in either factual television or documentaries versus research in scripted? Okay. And, and again, if you haven't done that, that's okay. Just uh, Well, I'll just jump in real fast and say, if anything, uh, coming out of the documentary space has made it so that I'm better at research in the scripted phase. Um, and then I almost have to stop myself because I want to make everything into a documentary. So I have to go, no, no, no. But I mean, I think it, you become more empathetic. You understand what other people are going through. Um, and then also when you're structuring a documentary, depending on um, what you're trying to tell your audience, you have to use some sort of, um, you know, convincing, you know, you have to figure out how do I speak to people who may not exactly agree you know, that gender bias is still a thing. <laughs> and so, so I think um, you just become a better storyteller. I, I feel like documentary, it just makes you get into people's heads so much deeper. And um, yeah. Um, I'd also, I'm sorry. No, I was, I also wanted to jump in. Uh, I started out coming out of college as a print journalist. So for me, Research is about everything. I mean, research is everything. Research is king, you know? Um, and that includes doing interviews with people, going to the library, you know, really, you know, digging deep. So, I mean, going into documentaries for me was a pretty natural uh, evolution because, yeah, you have to do, uh, I did a lot of research for Silent Choices, which is a documentary about abortion as it relates to African Americans. And particularly because at the time that I was making the film, which was the early aughts, there was very little research around that subject. There was research about obviously abortion, productive rights, Roe v. Wade, but very little either in documentary form or in printed form, uh, published, uh, published form about what that means to African Americans. And really my Bible for that book was a book by Dorothy Roberts called Killing a Black Body. She's a law professor at University of Pennsylvania. And everything else was like, you know, and again, we didn't really have the internet then. So a lot, it was a lot of talking to people that I knew, you know, uh, activists that I knew, um, you know, seeking out, uh, you know, newspaper articles and essays and stuff like that. So- So how is that it, different from research and scripted for you? I, I well, get it, I mean, factual. I, yeah, I mean, right. And I think for the two narrative shorts I did, I mean, those are more character studies. So I didn't have to do, there wasn't really a lot of research with that. But the, the, the script that I'm working on now that I'm developing now, Double Effect, again, I, I did do a lot of research with that because it deals with gentrification. It deals with uh, affordable housing, issues with race, issues with class, also religion. So I did have to do a lot. Uh, it was Almost, it felt like researching a doc actually for that film. So I guess with, with narrative, it really depends on the project. Obviously, if it's, you know, uh, Tame mentioned true crime, I mean, when you're dealing with real people, real events, you know, if you're either you're adapting it from another source, or I mean, even if you're creating an original piece, you still have to do a lot of research. You can't just sort of make, I mean, you obviously you take dramatic license, but you can't make things up out of folk, out of whole cloth. So, you know, it's going to require a level of uh, skill. And I would say if you're not good at research and you're not, particularly if you're not good at doing interviews with people, hire a research assistant, 
Hire someone that's good at that. Uh, I think that's a good investment um, the, if you're not good at doing it yourself. One of the things that I find so interesting and what I love about Factual is the research. I'm, a, I'm an information hound and I love doing interviews and I love that we are supposed to, nowadays not so much, but we are supposed to be factual and we have to dig deep and we have to vet and vet and vet and vet. Are we getting the facts? Are we getting the facts? Are we getting the facts? when I'm researching historical fiction, I'm researching real history, but then I'm, I, can, I can take it and jump off. I can take it and fly with it. So I actually get to tell a tall story based on research, based on history. And so, and I love both of them for those two different reasons. And, and it makes me crazy when I watch so-called documentaries today, which are not really documentaries and are not vetted for facts. And maybe we could go on about that on a whole other panel, but, so those are to be the two main differences and what I love about both of them. Carl, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just quickly. Um, yeah, it's like you said, when it started off, documentary was documentary and it was journalistic. You had to have three points for everything. And that happens, I think, in true crime, in a lot of the reality um, docudrama stuff. It, it's got to be um, factual. What I found that's close to fiction is reality TV. That just blew my mind. Um, I've only done a little bit of reality TV, but you, you know, you research, you you get some facts quickly, and then you draw the story, and it's just amazing. It's it, you know, I've I've typed up things in an afternoon, and we we shoot it the next day, and I'm amazed at people out there and how educated you are. You talk later maybe about blurring the lines, but how educated the public is because people are crying and weeping. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I just wrote that yesterday. It has nothing to do with your lives. What are you doing? And they just take stuff and run with it. And I just, I, I, that just blew my mind. I'm not such a big fan of that stuff, but. <laughs> I know, but we, it's like we, I said, I've done we make our livings. We make our livings. I get it. I get it. Can I ask Faith a question? Actually, I have a, a question for Faith. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm writing pilots and, and feature screenplays right now. And so far, they're all based off of, um, you know, write what you know, based off of my own experiences in life. Right. Um, but something dinged when you said you need to research uh, those characters as well. I wonder if you could, if you have any, um, any guidance for how to research further for dramatic um narrative writing even if it's based in your own experiences it's going to be fiction right it has that base in in real life but how would you direct the the research to make it more rich for the audience um I, and these are uh, these characters p based on real people or are these are composites of real people or just They're somebody you're just completely making up they're com they're either real people or composites of real people right mostly well yeah um i mean well i won't get into the rights conversation about like you know life rights and stuff like that um that's a separate issue but i would say particularly if it's somebody that you don't have access to or you're trying to avoid having to pay for life rights find people famous or if they're people you know in your circle who are that person and you know if they're open to it you could you know I would say do you like an interview or a phone interview or a zoom interview I mean obviously you can't take people off out for coffee right now but <laughs> yeah oh that would be what I would do you know take people out to lunch or take people out to coffee mm -hmm. get them more you know maybe have them feel more comfortable so they can open up can't really do that now but definitely a zoom interview phone interview um, sometimes even email if people are super busy give them a list of questions um i you know i think people who are like the people who are similar to that person that character you're writing about so do you mean like a doctor I, who is a gynecologist who like if you're trying is it a, a, a similar job description who might be facing the same issues that your character is facing so yeah i mean real research to then take yes. and stretch and mold into into scripted into a character Yes, I would say definitely similar jobs, but I also say similar character traits or similar, similar personality traits. Yeah. If someone's on the spectrum, if someone's a person of color, you know, you're not, then you, if so, and particularly with someone like, if someone, I mean, you said you were from, uh, you lived in New Orleans. Someone who's Creole, 
that's a that's a very specific thing. Yeah. So if you're writing someone who has a Creole background and maybe speaks Creole French, then you should do research on what it means to be Creole and what that's about. And don't just try to make it up and school in the French. So Creole French is not France French. Those are two different, you know what I'm saying? So things like that, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I get those, that's an example. Or, or you know, you were, you know, like if there's someone who is, uh, like, I mean, if you're writing for someone who uh, had COVID-19, then you want to talk to some people who had COVID-19 because COVID didn't affect everybody the same way. Um, it affects, you know, so you want to, and also talk, you know, I mean, do the research, obviously do the research on COVID, but I would say talk to as many people as you know who had it. And, you know, and also if, if, if you have, if they have friends or loved ones of those who died of COVID, if they're willing to talk to you about what those last days were, how painful it was, what kind of treatment they had to I get. Think research, so I think research, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move this on. Cause, uh, and I appreciate no, it, I think it's a really good point. The point being that research is incredibly important in both and, and for different reasons, but but having the doc skill of being able to interview people and really draw from them, as Ashley pointed out, it's like it really does enrich our work uh, in both spheres. So, but can I? I'm sorry. I know you want to move on. Just very quickly, I think people need to understand, and I don't want to sound ageist, but particularly younger filmmakers, research is not just going on Google. And I guess that's why I keep bringing up like interviewing people because it's not just I found an article. On, you know, on Google or whatever, and, and now I know what I need to know. I think it's very important to actually talk to people. So I just want to throw that out. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very good points, everybody. Um, if you, if, is everyone okay? I was going to get into uh, writing, but I want to, I think I want to move into casting. We're running out of time. Casting in the unscripted world and casting in the scripted world. We know they're both important. What are we looking for differently or the same in both fields in casting? People think there's no such thing as casting in the unscripted world. Go ahead, Carl. Well, I, I think for both, you're looking for great characters, right? I mean, you know, somebody said that, you know, if you got a good script and good characters, 80% of your film's done. You know, you can point the camera at them and get it done. So, I mean, I, mean, I come from scripted and went to unscripted, back to uh, scripted. It's, it, I'm, I'm always amazed at how much uh, good characters, good storytelling, just narrative is the key. And I, it confused me in a way when I first started out because I went, you know, from scripted to unscripted and thinking I just had to capture reality. You know, I wanted to bring the reality out. And then after many years, I realized that you're still looking for the same things. You're still looking for that hook, that emotional point. You're looking for truly what's behind what people are saying, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you're looking for basically the same thing. Of course, actors are not reality people. They, they bring their own basket of skills and great actors they'll do the research that Faith is talking about. They'll go out and do stuff and bring a lot to your production that you can't ask real people to do. Real people can bring their reality. So that, that to me is the difference. I also want to um, press on the issue, like you wanna make sure you find somebody that you can work with. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's always going to be variables. There's always going to be situations where, oh, I really want this actor and they're tough. Okay, deal with it. But especially um, on earlier projects, you want to have somebody who is just as much on the team as you are. And in documentary, that might be tough. But I mean, this is something I tell uh, documentary filmmakers all the time. When that person you're following is aware, is over aware that they're on camera and being followed, it's no longer authentic. And uh, I really, I learned that the hard way. We were following some characters and um, they started telling me that I was filming the wrong stuff. And they were saying, this is not the story, Ashley. And I'm like, what? You know, and uh, I just had that lesson. And then I found some characters that totally fit into what I was trying to tell. And if anything brought even more to it, especially because they were so flexible and open to just helping. So it's really important if you can get people, uh, characters, you know, actors or not that are going to be on your team. 
my experience has been that uh, people in unscripted who really are excited to have their real story on television think that you're going to be following them around with like a little like with your phone you know just shooting them for a day or two and if they become characters in a the actual series and they're in several episodes and by episode five they are so sick of being followed around they are so sick of having to turn up and repeat lines because they've jumped on each other they have no skills for this and, and it's very difficult to cast because it's very difficult to know if that's how they're going to react under the incredible pressure and stress that's everyone that everyone's and, and so it's, it's hit and miss. I've had some pretty crazy situations where I think you turn it, so you're not just directing, you're, you're a psychiatrist, you're a friend, you're a sister, you're a mother, you're a sibling, you're, a, you know, you're just, you're turning yourself inside out, where with an actor, there's other challenges, but they, as Carl said, they bring a skill set, and they've been through the process, or they've been trained by coaches and teachers, so that at least you, and you know that you can do possibly more than two takes without them completely draining right it's like it just i think it's it's just a different skill set that we bring to both worlds but um i think that it's very hard to know in casting and it's just why you, it's a numbers game almost and you have to and then they you have to shoot around their schedules you're not paying them so they're busy this weekend or there's someone's getting married or they can't it, it it's just it's it's chaos well you need to reiterate that you're not paying them in documentary that's unethical if <laughs> so keep that in mind what is unethical to not pay them or uh, it's unethical, unethical to pay them yeah. there's I mean, it, a lot of debate over that but i know and it's it's right. constant uh, often, let's often for for sorry for for depending on the documentary that you're doing i think um it's funny what, what ashley was saying because i think you're you're totally right but also i feel sometimes you have to listen carefully to the people that you are interviewing if depending on the documentary it is because you're you're getting something from them and be true to them uh, as well I've, i think in a lot of the the shows that we do we need to create a show in a certain amount of time and we're kind of pushing the process along i i yearn for the time when you kind of listen to people and say like what do you got you know because that's what i want it used to be in the Alan King days of documentary that he would spend a year with a family or a hospital or a high school and he would just follow them around. And so he'd be embedded and they would, they would stop thinking about him. That's a very different world we're living in today where we have to deliver a show a week. And it's just, it's a, it's a whole different ballgame, but we have to, we have to deliver the same sense of authenticity. It's, it's tricky. It's definitely tricky. Can I just jump in and say something quickly? Um, I agree with Ashley. I do feel that, I mean, that you should not pay participants in documentaries. I can't talk about reality TV. I've never worked in it, but in documentaries, typically you don't pay people. Now, I will say, if someone is paid, that should be disclosed in the film. That's what drives me like totally nuts. Like that Billy McFarlane fire documentary, I believe Hulu did. He was paid for that interview and they never disclosed that in the film. So it's, you know, it, it comes off as, oh, it's objective and he's just talking. It's like, well, no, it's not objective if you gave him a check. So I just want, you know, I just want that's a different debate for another panel, but I just want to throw that out. Also, and I think this is with, with doc, I think this is with uh, fiction and nonfiction. You, they're going to be, I mean, I'm sure we've all had this experience where people, particularly in docs, like they get in and they're like, oh yeah, I want to do this, yay. Um, like certain characters and then for whatever reason they drop out. And I know I've, I've had that happen to me and that, you know, sort of changed the trajectory of the film. So you gotta be prepared to pivot and sometimes maybe even start over and that sucks, but you have to be able to really be malleable as far as what you're doing with your film. And yeah, casting as far as um, fiction is huge because don't, don't think you because that actor has experience and, you know, cause they wanna get hired, but once they get there, they could get in their feelings about something. So not just hire the best actor, but really hire somebody that you can work with that gets your vision of the film and you as a filmmaker and, you know, and they're not just doing it for the, the, the credit or the money or whatever, because that can be a disaster too. Really good points. Um, before we move on from casting, I just want to let you know that in Britain, subject matter experts, SMEs, scientists, etc., 
will not give an interview unless they're paid a standard, what's called an SME fee. It's just, that's how it's done there. They won't turn up for the interview otherwise. So I found that very interesting. It's like uh, my little Canadian self went, what, 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 what? what? But that's what they do. Um, really quick, there's debate in the true crime world uh, we do not pay sheriffs, prisoners, family members, etc. The people that we interview that are part of the real, not the reenactment, but the reality, the documentary part of it, um, they do not get paid. And, and, and we've been told in the past that that was exploitative because the show is making money and the families should be compensated. And uh, so that's, and the way that uh, we cast those people is based on who's most cooperative. And then the way we cast um, the actors who come in to be the, the reenactment, uh, the real playing real life people, they, it's really based on their, their ability, their cooperative, their cooperation, um, you know, good notes that we've gotten from the casting director and how much they look like the real person. That's the hard part. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I've been on sh I've been on shows where someone who has to give up work in order to work with us on the show will be offered a stipend to cover the lost wages that they are giving up in order to do it. So I think it's a gray area. I think it, it depends on the situation on the show. It's it's very interesting. Let's move on quickly because we're really running. I know we're just all have so much to say, and I love it. Um, let's, let's move into, well, let's move into production. Like, what's it like to, what are the differences and the similarities between shooting a documentary and shooting scripted? Who wants to talk? I'll go really quick. Huge difference in my experience. Um, because while you do have to be flexible and be able to pivot at any moment, in uh, scripted production and documentary who you have really got to be you know open to the graces as they flow through the you know through the ether and to your camera it's uh very different it's also tends to be much smaller when it's a documentary it tends to be uh many fewer people certainly not 45 to 175 crew members um, no matter what, the, the commonality is having a positive attitude, being grateful, um, being joyful, being inclusive, being loving, um, seeing everyone as your family, I think makes a big difference. Having respect for the people that are working for you, I know from experience as an AD, it fully affects the final product. So I'd say those are the, that's the similarity. <laughs> Carl, and then uh, let's go on to pro post production because that's an important yeah, one to get to. Just, just to to me, the the, the fast snapshot is like you, you know you're working in a craft show, like a craft thing, as opposed to a GM plant. I mean, it is so funny the the, the differences. Like Tome was saying, that you know the amount of people there's that so all that that plant etiquette, you know, on a large scripted show. Um, there's so many meetings, so many layers, um, which you do face sometimes on, say, uh, docudramas. There's that same levels and layers, less if you're doing your own documentary. Um, you know, if you're doing your own documentary, you're pretty well at the top trying to make all your decisions, trying to do all those things. Whereas if you're in scripted, there's so many layers that you're, it's actually almost like a management position. You're juggling everybody's egos above you from different parts, different countries. Uh, and trying to just say, you know, here's where we want to go and sell it. It's like selling your idea as a, as a, as a, a director on, on a scripted show that's large. It's almost like daily you're selling your idea that you're going down this road. Whereas in smaller productions, you're, you know, you're, you're there with just your crew, which is great. Your family, like Tomei was saying. Um, but respect goes a long way everywhere. You know, uh, you need people to work with you and you need to be a team leader in both cases. I agree with you. I often think about um, I, when I'm working in unscripted with a crew of four or five people, uh, it's like being Picasso doing his doodles, you know, fast, furious and fabulous, just bam, and it's there. 
it's not that simple. But then when I get to work in scripted, I get to work in oil paints. So I get to, you know, develop stories, character arcs. It's just think about my shots. I can actually think about my shots sometimes for the most part. So it's, but you're right. Then that becomes, can become an encumberment. I love documentaries because it's run and gun. Let's go grab that shot. And, and we can't, you don't grab shots usually in script. I've seen it happen occasionally. So, all right. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, post-production. I think this is a huge difference. Who has worked in post-production in both unscripted and scripted? Ashley. Well, I'll just quickly say, um, I think it really depends too on who is your, your um, distributor. Like if you are working with a studio, your post-production can be either or. Uh, personally, um, Obviously on the scripted, I was doing it under deadline. And so that was very specific. We had a structured post. Every single time I tried to add structure to the documentary, we just blew past it. And I was like, great, another year has passed. So it's just really like post-production, I think the hardest part was answering the question, when is your documentary gonna be done? And I'm like, I just go away, but it's done. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I would just say, I think for both scripted and unscripted, hire the best editor that you can afford because that person is going to be your savior on a lot of things. And, and also the sound editor, not just picture editor, but also a good sound editor and sound mixer um, because sound is super important. And, and I would actually say, that, to piggyback on the production part, Try if you can afford to hire a sound recordist, do that. You know, I do. I mean, I'm working on something right now where I'm doing my own sound and I'm like, oh god, but you know, COVID, I don't really have a choice in the matter, and I know that's going to make it harder and post and probably make it more expensive, but I've just accepted that that's what's going to be. But yeah, the, your picture and sound editors are going to be so again, huge. So hire someone that you trust that you have, you're on the same page, they know what you're trying to do creatively. And, you know, and, and to me, that's something that's where I know a lot of people just say, oh, I'll edit myself. To me, it's like, unless you are good at that, you know, if you have the money to hire somebody who's, who's, who specializes in that, please, please do that. At the same time, when you're first coming up, please take the time to learn how to edit your own stuff or your friend's stuff. Because that is really, for me, that's where I learned the difference between directing live world and filmed world was when I learned how to edit. Because I had all these experimental films and documentaries from New Orleans or whatever. Editing those together completely shifted my understanding of the medium uh, and also taught me how it gave me so much respect for editors. And then please learn from me that how important sound is. <laughs> Please listen to your sound dailies. Please get the best sound person you possibly can, pay them, find a way to pay them, you know, eat beans and rice and pay your sound person. It'll I save. I just want to say that for- Agreed. There's three, there's three um, layers of writing. The first, uh, both in scripted and unscripted, there's writing in, in advance. Then there's writing during the directing. Then there's writing through the editing. And it's, they're just all important. In doc, it's even more important because that's where the story is actually put together. And so, yeah, I, I to me, editors are geniuses. <laughs> I've worked in all, all the way through in both. And, and it's not that it's easier in scripted, um, but there's certainly less choice and, um, Man, I hats, hats off to documentary editors these days, yeah. in factual television in particular. Carl, you Documentary went editors are amazing. I mean, they really take stuff that you've brought, and it's usually unexpected stuff and all that unexpected stuff you've got, and fold it into a story. You know, I find a, a lot of good um, scripted editors, I mean, they, ex they know what to expect, right? They expect something's coming, you know, they expect what the script is, but documentary editors, they can often work magic. I've seen, yeah, just enough. I, I'm sure we've all been there and seen it, but 
I tell you, a documentary editor is worth gold and their perspective is amazing. And just talk to them. I think Faith mentioned this, talk to them beforehand, you know, get on sync. They'll, they'll, they'll make your show. Well, there's a million other things I wanted to cover. You guys are much, much too interesting. I think, do we have time, uh, Rashida, to do a Q and A? If anybody's, everybody's been so nice and quiet other than us. So, are there any questions from anybody? And if so, just stick your hand up, and I'll, I'll get to you. Here's a question, Carmen. Yeah, I'm curious about um, in the scripted versus unscripted world, how you deal with imposter syndrome, if you've felt that before and experienced it. Um, just as a young filmmaker, it'd be great to hear your experiences if you're willing to share. I think that's a great question. Who wants to answer it? Who's ever felt like an imposter, an imposter when you're going into a situation you're not really sure you can handle? Sorry. I think... I mean, I'm not sure if imposter is the right word for me, but I mean, you feel all the time that sometimes you're out of your element. I mean, you, 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 you know, I think that you've got to step up. Sometimes you've got to, to, to bluff it. You've got, to, you want to keep calm on your set. You want to, you know, feel like you know what you're doing. So I don't know about feeling like an imposter, but you definitely feel out of your depth more times than you'd probably like. And sometimes it's a good thing. Ashley. So one way to get around it is to do the research and do the preparation. Uh, get ready for any question that someone's going to throw your way. And then how would you all recommend the I don't know yet statement, you know, like, give me a minute, let me figure that out. Um, so that's something really important. And I mean, right now I'm in that, I'm in that space where, okay, I'm ready to transition back to scripted. Are people going to take me seriously? You know, I, I already said, I'm so used to opposition, like whatever, you know, but yeah, there are days where I go, is the documentary good enough? Am I good? You know, it happens. It happens to everyone. And they're always, it seems like we're always comparing ourselves. I've done all this amazing work, but I haven't done this. And it's like, okay, catch yourself when you do that. Cause you have done amazing work, Carmen. I would say um, in, the, in the scripted world, if you have a choice, if it's a feature or a short film, if you have a choice of ADs, make sure that you have a first assistant director who really has your back, who is experienced, who is kind, who is strong and who has your back. I, I use one of two ADs every time I direct or produce since 1998. Uh, and also make sure that your cinematographer wants to bring your vision to life, has creative ideas as well, but is there to support your vision and is there to help you become uh, more realized as a director. So um, that I think having a great first AD and having a DP who takes direction from women, well, um, there are many, many, many DPs who do, many are women. And, uh, and I, I also personally, my, my sets are always incredibly diverse and somehow there seems to be, there's just a lot of compassion and a lot of rooting for each other. Um, so that, I think that helps too. I, I got some uh, really good advice at one point um, in scripted directing. Before you go into every day, know what you want and why you want it. So you really have that. So because everything's gonna change and it changes constantly, whether you're scripted or unscripted, you're just really flying by the seat of your pants and you bet you don't feel like an expert half the time because you're in a brand new situation, especially in docs, like <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. So partly you're faking it till you make it. And partly you really are prepped as everybody else has said, and you have surrounded to the best of your ability yourself with a, a really good supportive team. And also you've done your homework, you know, what you want and why you want it. And that, way, I, that arms you. Oh, I'm sorry. No, just very quickly, this is Faith. Uh, I just, I can't ditto what Tomei said enough about having a really great AD that 
And I would also say a line producer as well, or UPM, unit production manager. Those people, because it's, when you're stressed out, they, can, they are your face to the crew. So in some ways, they sort of give you, as a director, protection if necessary. Or just, you know, they, like, like she said, they have your back as far as, you know, things that from a, you know, creatively you're trying to get this done, you're trying to make your pages, you're trying to make your days. And there's some crew person like, I didn't like my lunch or these lenses are, these lenses suck, you know, and they are sort of there to be your protection. And in some cases, maybe deal with that cinematographer that isn't good with taking direction from a female director. And sometimes those, those DPs are also women. Unless you you're in, un, unless you're in unscripted and then you're on your own. <laughs> well, that's right. You, well, with everybody. You're, so that's why being as prepped as possible is really important. Rashida is back. Are you, I, I'm sure you want us to finish here. Do we have any time for any more questions? I see someone else has popped up. Do we have time, Rashida? Um, yeah, let's answer Alex's question. And then if no one else has anything, then that's it. Go ahead, Alex. You on mute, Alex. Oh, hi. Uh, I just want to ask uh, everybody here um, a simple question. Uh, how do you know that your idea is a good idea that is marketable? How do you know that your work? So th that's, that's my question. I think that goes back to the imposter syndrome. And, and I echo what Faith said about the producer. Um, when you get your team together, and it's good to find people who believe in your idea with you. Uh, I think you can, if you've written a script or you've got a pitch package together, I would practice, first of all, the script should be on the third or fourth or fifth draft before you actually shoot it. Meaning that you've already had a table read, you've heard people speak it out loud, and you've made notes, you've taken notes from other people. Um, and if it's a pitch, you've pitched it to friends first, the family, then friends, then other professionals. And again, you've pitched it three to five times already before you take it somewhere uh, where it can be picked up. Um, and ultimately, you're the only one who knows. If you're passionate about it, then it's a good story. I was going to say the same thing. If First, it's got to grip you incredibly. I mean, it's got to feel like powerful when you, you say it to yourself and then take it out there and nobody will be able to reproduce it I think in in that form sell it out there pitch it to people pitch it around talk to people get as much feedback as you can you'll be able to hone it and you'll know whether it's a good idea I think that's the only way we, we all are faced with that not knowing if our idea is good enough or ready enough or whatever talk to people about it pitch them say hey you know talk to your your log lines talk give them a synopsis let them read part of the script. You know what I mean? And if you feel passionate about it, just go sell it, sell it and see what you get back and adjust. Are you talking about an idea, Alex, and just uh, like a show idea or uh, can I just understand a little bit better about what you're, what you're wondering about? Um, um, for, for, for all ideas, kinds of uh, like, like documentary ideas or is it a, a script that you wrote for a short film or feature okay. film? Okay. Yeah. No, I agree. I think Carlin and Tomei hit it right. And, and I think sometimes uh, filmmakers worry about taking their ideas out and telling them to people for fear that their ideas are going to be taken or stolen. And, and I think that is a valid concern. So as they both said, go to your friends, go to friends or be in a, you know, get involved with a writer's group or some of the people that you trust who will give you that feedback. And as Carl said, be passionate about it because if it's a good idea, it's demanding to be made and it's chosen you to be made. And if you don't make it, someone else is gonna make it. It, it will leave you if you don't honor it, so. I, th I think the one, one thing I can add is be prepared to work on it for a long time. I think all of us have ideas that we've put in and you know, five years down the line, we're still you know, wrestling with it, so. Make sure that you feel passionate enough to go years with it. You know, it's not, it's not going to be done tomorrow. I see. Thank you. I think we're sneaking Miriam in here. Go ahead, Miriam. Um, real quick. 
Uh, what is your favorite movie and who's your favorite director that inspired you or vision or color palette or anything that really just inspires you? Um, well, I already said my favorite documentary is Hoop Dreams. Uh, my favorite narrative film is Network. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Sydney, Sydney <laughs> Lumet is amazing. Uh, I also love Paul Greengrass. I love, well, he's problematic, but I love Oliver Stone. Uh, love Spike Lee. He's also, he's also problematic. I um, also love Catherine Bigelow because she makes films that people don't expect women to make and she really doesn't give a damn. She's just sort of like, yeah, I'm going to make a film about an, an IED, not IED, I'm sorry, IED, uh, you know, bomb explosive guy and, you know, in the, in the Iraq war. And, you know, I mean, well, she won an Oscar for it. And I, I think that's awesome. So, um, yeah, so that's my answer very quickly. Mine is uh, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, Paper Moon, Ooh. Wrestler, and about 250 other films. <laughs> uh, favorite directors would include Frank Capra, Scorsese. I can watch Casino once a week and not tire of it. Um, uh, let's see. Hal Ashby, who made Harold and Maude, um, Aronofsky. Just a few of my favorites uh, that inspired me. If I could make a film that is as relevant as It's a Wonderful Life is 80 years after it was made, uh, my life will have been, you know, purpose fulfilled, done. <laughs> um, I'll jump in. Uh, so sometimes it's like depending on my mood of the day, but uh, today it's uh, Wes Craven and the movie Scream, his scream. And um, I actually got to tell him that I saw it at a slumber party when I was little and I wasn't allowed. And he's like, yes, you know, I didn't love it. He, um, I got, he, he was my mentor. I was like so honored. I got to actually work with him right before he passed away. So uh -huh. he's always on my list. Fantastic. I've got to say, I've got so many films that are my favorite, but I think Spike Lee's films are like any of those. Um, there's so many films that sort of step through my life, but it, strangely enough, I think one of the times I was most down about Hollywood film, Blue Velvet was a, a show that just kind of turned the tables. You know, whether it's the greatest film or not, it just opened up another door that you don't have to do the straight, I would hate to say Hollywood type film, but you know, that kind of movie of the week film. And it sort of woke me up. And so, there, but there's so many films that I love. Any of the greats is amazing, just amazing. I have the same problem. I, there's just hundreds um, and everything everyone else has <laughs> said are, are on my top list too. There's, there's two films that, that were game changing for me. One is Jane Campion's um, The Piano. Oh. Actually, even her film before that, um, The Table, The Table. Forget the name of it. An but angel, an angel, angel at my, at my table. table. Thank you, thank you, thank Absolutely. you. She, she, she uh, showed female sexuality for the first time on screen for me. I had no such, I had no idea that such a thing even existed in film. It was just, I was sitting in a theater in New York, um, Midtown New York, and watching this film. And at a certain point, the uh, Harvey Keitel walks around and around and around and around her. I don't know if you've seen the film. And then he comes in and he actually puts his finger on the, the hole in her stocking at her knee. And he just, and every female in the theater went, <gasps> like everybody just, there was like electrifying. And I went, oh my God, what did I just see? It was, it was, it was a nothing nothing moment and I, I'm always amazed of nothing moments and my other recent really favorite film is a film called Maudie. It's a small film by an Irish director about a Canadian art painter, a self-taught painter. Small story told brilliantly and I just, it's just along with 2001 which is another, I mean I've got so many favorites as well. Best uh, documentary ever in my opinion that helped keep me alive when I was struggling for, uh, physically when we were kings mm. when mm. we were kings trans it, it it shows how muhammad ali transcended everything but he transcended the sport that he used as a vehicle for social change and uh it's just incredible rashida i almost forgot parasite 
how did I, Parasite, 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 <laughs> Bong Joon-ho, oh my God, Parasite, I just wanted to say that. Oh, hi. Uh, I would love to know what the favorite films are of our, of our participants here today. Is it possible for them to just list one, Rashida? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, go right ahead. I do have to go, but um, yeah, I, I think that probably shouldn't take very long. So go go right for it. If Nikki, if you want, I can make you a host and you can close it out <laughs> when you're done. It will be fast. I'm just, Carmen, what's your favorite movie? It's not fair. It changes all the time, but um, recently, Grizzly Man by Herzog. I like that one a lot. Awesome. Nice. Miriam? Uh, hands down, Labyrinth. Yep. <laughs> Alex? Uh, I have a lot of favorite films, but I, I, yeah, there's so many films, so. Okay, that's but, okay. Yeah. Kate? Uh, Oh my God, I got way too many, but I love Parasite. I, I couldn't even tell you what my favorite film is. I've got so many. <laughs> I think, I mean, I have to say one thing. I'm probably the oldest person in this little room. And uh, I loved listening to your stories because I've been through practically every single thing you said. Um, but um, you don't have to go to film school. You just have to show up. Um, there were no film schools when I was starting. My, uh, my, X and I were actually running something like one. Um, and uh, I've taught many, many young filmmakers and the best way to get in there is to just get in there and show people your stuff and never stop trying. And um, Nikki and I have a project we've been working on for quite a number of years. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, but we sure have had fun along the way. Me too. Um, and uh, anyway, so I, I couldn't even tell you a favorite. Film. That's okay. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been an amazing, amazing time for me. I've really enjoyed all of you. It was fantastic. Thank you. Rashida. Yeah. You, you Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I've been sitting here listening the whole time. I've been multitasking, but I've heard everything that you guys said. Very insightful. Um, again, I appreciate your time. Uh, we still have one full day left in the Circle City Film Festival. So, um, if you guys, you know, find some time in your schedules and want to pop onto the website and check out some of the films, you're more than welcome to do so. We encourage you to do so. Um, for those of you who are attending, um, then we also have um, an acting workshop. If any of you are interested in acting, we have an acting workshop um, tomorrow at noon with actor Dennis White. Um, and we have our grand finale of the film festival that we have every year, uh, the Chelsea Awards is what we call our award show. And it is named after a friend of mine who was also an actress who passed away uh, a week before our first annual film festival. So we, um, we honor her in that way. We give away a $500 acting scholarship. So. Um, if you guys are free, come join us again on Zoom. Just let me know. I'll shoot you the Zoom link. It's at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you again for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank take you, care. everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Did you Thanks. did you take a picture, Thanks. Faith, uh, Rashida? I've got several pictures and videos. <laughs> <laughs> take care. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. All right. Safe, everybody.